talk about a topic that's been a part of many conversations, uh, but specifically talk about uh, the workforce development and educator diversity uh, that's needed for our teachers and our school leaders. And so I'd like to welcome our panelists, Dr. Browning, who is the CEO of TNTP, Dr. Javed Siddiqui, who is the president and CEO of the Hunt Institute, and Dr. Bernard Harris, who's the CEO of the National Math and Science Initiative. I'd love to welcome um, and invite our panelists to give a few opening remarks about why this is important to them um, and the work that they're doing with their respective organizations. Dr. Browning. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This, this is important because our very democracy is at stake. If we don't have teachers in front of students to make sure that kids have access to opportunities and are successful, we won't have a labor, more, a labor a, a force, a workforce for any industry in any sector. So it's interesting to me sometimes that people see this as a K-12 or an education issue. This is a national issue. Our organization is working really hard to make sure that not only we do a better job of recruiting and bringing more people into the profession, but that we shift policies and practices to actually make it a tenable job and an attractive job that people actually want to come into. Thank you. Dr. Siddiqui. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. My friends at the Reagan Institute. Uh, Ashley and I work together in case you haven't figured it out. So it's, good. <laughs> it's good to be in D.C. with you. Um, this is a, I, I would echo Tequila's uh, sentiments, but we are sort of ventured into this, what we're calling this One Man Teachers of Color Collaborative. TNTP uh, and the Hunt Institute. Uh, I kind of refer to it as like a, a, a the ship terminology. We're like the sort of uh, captain, co-captain. Uh, depends on the situation. If there's an iceberg, she's the captain. Uh, <laughs> if we're smooth sailing, we'll be the captain. Uh, but we have some great crewmates uh, at Ed Trust, uh, Center for Ed Black Male Educator, uh, yeah. Teach Plus, Latinas yeah. for Education, uh, MCEL, which is Men of Color and Educational Leadership, and New Leaders. I'm sure I'm leaving some people oh, out. It. That's it? That's it? Oh, good. Uh, and so we're excited about this. But uh, those of you who probably saw the virtual uh, program yesterday with Governor Cooper, this really is something we've been looking at for the past 20 years uh, at the Institute, which predates me. I haven't been there 20 years. Uh, but this is an issue that's been important to Governor Hunt, uh, not only just diversifying the classrooms, making the classrooms representative. So kids feel a sense of like somebody that looks like me, somebody who's had experiences like me. But it's become more important these last several years. And Governor Cooper in North Carolina, when he came out, wanted to really lead on this issue. You know, we were thankful that he came to the Hunt Institute and wanted to sort of partner with us to help him facilitate this. Uh, and he, so he, he brought 350 people together for a two-day uh, summit, and this is like two years ago. Um, and that turned into a year-long task force by executive order. So we facilitated, shepherded that whole process, and a host of recommendations came out of it. And what we realized, because North Carolina's our home, so it's kind of like our, our laboratory, our kitchen. Was there's, there's a huge opportunity to really to scale this nationally. And so we went to our friends, and uh, they were working on some issues similar. And so that's where this sort of One Million Teachers of Color Collaborative came. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more of the mechanics behind it as we go, but this has become um, something that I think our entire organization, as Tequila mentioned, our early childhood folks, our higher ed folks, and certainly our K-12 folks are really trying to figure out what is their nexus point to the work because um, there's, a, there's a huge opportunity. And sometimes it's daunting thinking about one million teachers of color. We, we have to find one million teachers of color while at the same time not losing any teachers over the next 10 years. Exactly. Bernard Harris, uh, CEO of the National Math and Science Initiative, and I want to know how to join the partnership. <laughs> anyway, I have been part of this organization about 15 years, and before that, uh, 15 years with, the, uh, with my own foundation focus in, in math and science education, uh, so that's important to me. Uh, the other thing is that I'm a, I'm a third generation teacher. So I teach medical school, I teach taught business school, and I consider myself following in the footsteps of my mother and my great aunt that, that were teachers. Uh, that's why it's important to me. Um, you, you just mentioned something that I think is really important. You know that, uh, you probably know this, I'm like preaching to the choir here, that only 17% of teachers are people of color. And about half you know, African American and half uh, Latino and Hispanic. Uh, that's a real problem when you think about the, the students in which they're serving. And so uh, at the National Math and Science Initiative, 
What we're trying to do is to, to increase that number, even though we're not part of the partnership, we want to be part of the solution uh, that's happening in terms of bringing more t teachers to address this issue. Thank you all. And events like this are so exciting because not only do we learn about who's doing this work alongside us, we're able to come together and bring together our resources to have a greater impact um, on the educator workforce. This question is for each of our panelists. While we have seen an increase in the number of educators considering leaving or actually leaving the profession, this hasn't been a new issue. It's something we've seen prior to the pandemic. The pandemic might have increased it or exasperated the issue, but I'd love for you all to talk about what trends have you seen in teacher turnover and recruitment over the past few years? What are the trends that you've seen in states um, related to pay raises, as that's been a significant topic of conversation and how to recruit and retain teachers? Yeah, it's actually a good question. At TNCP, and our organization is 25 years old, so happy birthday to us. Um, <laughs> but we've been at this work. We, our actual founding was based on sort of solving for the talent issue. And so it's been interesting to hear people now lift up, oh, wow, there's a teacher shortage because of COVID. And we immediately go to actually the data show that um, this has been a decades forming problem and COVID has certainly exacerbated it. Now I will say if you look at some of the latest data, we're losing from the profession broadly like half a million teachers over the last couple of years. Out of, and so when you hear us talk about we need one million new teachers of color, I want to anchor in we don't have enough teachers writ large, let alone teachers of color. And so people ask, because you I've been hearing my background, I was a you know researcher, school social worker, all these things. So when I hear these mixed messages, I mean I'm like, okay, this is like media schizophrenia. And so it's like, what is the truth? One day we hear, oh, teachers are leaving in droves, then the next day, oh no, they're not. The truth of the matter is yes, we, we're in a very dire situation. And the reason this is important, there's a lot of talk about, you know, learning acceleration and learning loss and, you know, unfinished learning and trying to catch kids up because of COVID. That's all critical. If we don't have talented, effective teachers in the classroom, we're dead in the water. And when I say effective, I mean effective and diverse. And just, I want to just really, because we get this question a lot, like why the focus on diverse teachers? Like, is this because, you know, your moral compass says it so? I want to be unambiguous. The data bear out that, frankly, all students benefit from having a more diverse teacher force, particularly students of color. And so if you hear the numbers about the representation and the gaps that we're seeing, it has real and significant out impact on the outcomes for students. So again, not a nice to have. This is about actually outcomes for all students, and particularly those that we've been miserably failing. And the last thing I'll say is, so it's not even a question of either or. We get the question, is it the pipeline, or is it we're losing too many? It's actually, frankly, both. We don't have enough teachers coming into mm -hmm. the profession. If you look at the data across your state, which it's interesting there, we, there's not often a lot of good, um, accurate data, over the past few decades, we've seen the numbers in traditional college of education programs continually decline. You've seen it in our HBCUs who have been early on were a driving force in producing teachers, but we're seeing it all across the country. And then on the other side, once teachers are in the profession, we're seeing a lot. I'm glad you mentioned compensation. That is certainly one factor. I mean, this is a labor issue. I mean, think about when our country faced the, nur uh, the nursing shortage. Everybody was afraid, oh my God, if I end up in a hospital, in a doctor's office, there's not going to be a nurse to help me. We solved for that. We looked at different roles that looked different ways to get and encourage and incentivize people to go into the profession. Why are we not doing that for teaching? I mean, I don't think we get that we are all in jeopardy if we don't have a labor force. Good luck having that nurse who doesn't even have their basic foundational skills because we didn't have enough teachers, effective and diverse teachers in the classroom. Thank you. Dr. Siddiqui. Uh, I would just want to say ditto to all of that. <laughs> you know, as a former school principal, there's a saying in the, in the principal world that you know, teachers don't leave schools, uh, they leave leaders. Uh, so a little, little plug for our campaign, it's one million teachers of color because that's like a nice, really cool uh, headliner. But sort of sub, the, one other goal is 30,000 school leaders of color. So it's important that we, again, diversify the leadership pipeline because I think that leaders coming in with diverse perspectives might help 
offset some of the issues, might encourage some other folks coming into buildings. Oftentimes, and I've been in inner city schools and I've been in a urban school, I mean, suburban schools, you don't see a whole lot of black and Hispanic teachers in suburban schools. Uh, they also want to feel welcomed, and I think that's part of that. Maybe I think 10 years ago we were doing some, it was become cool multicultural professional development and trying to make teachers more sort of aware, empathetic of the plight of other of their colleagues and students certainly in the community. So all these things have been building. And what happened with the pandemic is like we got in a people into the world of teaching. We always, those of you that have kids or grandkids, you, you, you invariably walk by a classroom in ways that we've never done before because they were plugging in virtually and you were listening and you were hearing your kids learn or not learn. Uh, cameras on, cameras off. You were hearing teachers make comments. You were hearing the, the sort of the trials and tribulations of managing a classroom, let alone a virtual classroom. And so we, we, the average voter citizen, became a little bit more aware. The media started running these stories. But these issues predate the pandemic. Uh, I don't think money is the only issue, but there's some really cool things happening. Uh, um, Florida just raised, uh, the governor down there just raised, I think the average increase is going to be $7,000 uh, to start salaries in, in Florida. Mississippi, uh, the, Tate Reeves is one of our Hunt Kane fellows, so we always want to give him a shout out. Uh, some are going to see upwards of 21% uh, increase in pay. But if we think pay and pay alone is going to solve this problem, we're sadly mistaken. And I'll, I'll end on uh, educator prep programs because uh, Tequila sort of uh, got into this a little bit. Um, having been with some deans uh, recently, they're seeing an alarming uh, regression of, uh, mm -hmm. one, just applicants to universities. We, so we see admissions are going down. Applications are down. Admissions are down. And so when applications and admissions are down at the university, it's going to impact the schools of education more than any other school. Because schools of education, if you look at the data, end up being pl almost places where the bottom court, some, some people say the bottom quartiles, I've heard bottom 10%, depending on the University of SAT outcomes for the uh, incoming class. So if the numbers are going down, the folks that are going to fill in the engineering schools, the business schools, uh, more than they get into the schools of education. So we really have to think differently. Yeah, we've been talking about professionalizing uh, um, teaching. and. Engineers, teachers, they should be on the same platform. Uh, I took, uh, my wife and I took our kids, our, both are 15 and 19. This is what, they wanted to go see Minions the other day. I was like, oh, let's go see Thor. They wanted to see Minions. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I remember in the movie, uh, they actually, there was a piece in the movie where they just crushed teachers. And I'm thinking, this, this movie is going to be in front of millions and millions of young people, and you guys are just making teaching look terrible. And that's, so we're all part of the problem. You know, so we got to wake up and be part of the solution. Dr. Harris? Can I say ditto, ditto? <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, so two things as, as I was listening. Uh, first of all, let me talk about what the pandemic did for us. Our, our organization primarily focuses on professional development and the teacher as the focus of uh, access to students. And so in doing so, we have uh, accessed over 2 million students. Uh, we trained about 65,000 teachers around the nation. We are a national, national program. When COVID hit, we had a tremendous uh, drop in access to teachers, mainly because teachers were uh, in this twilight zone initially, right? So they went from face to face to now having to do virtual and many we're not trained in that. You know, we talk about how our kids are, you know, they, they, they adopt uh, this digital world much easier than, than uh, we do. And if you look at the teacher demographics, the same thing happens there. They're, they're not as, as um, uh, converse in this. And so that was a challenge for them. And then the students, of course, had to figure out how to now take instruction from home. And that also was a, was a big issue. So if my job as the CEO uh, was to get more teachers into our trainings, we had uh, terrible uh, outcomes initially because they were just too busy. And when we went out and we asked the question about, you know, you know what is it that's keeping you from the training, they said, we just don't have time. We've got the administration pulling at us, we've got students pulling at us, we've got parents pulling at us. And so I think that in part is, is part of the reason why we've lost so many teachers and continue to lose, lose so many teachers. Um, 
and then the last thing I'll say uh, on the point about paying our teachers more, I agree, is it's less about, you know, it's not, it's not only about paying teachers. Uh, but I will say this, that if we're going to invest in any profession in this country, it has to be in our teachers. We have to professionalize the, the teaching force, and we have to pay them like we pay engineers. The greatest investment that we can make, and let me back up to say this, I'm, I, I've had a very background, and one of the things that I've done in the past is that I've run a venture capital business, uh, still running it, invest in companies, and we look for the return on investment, we look for where to place our money to get the biggest outcome. And so if you look at uh, all of this, and you look at it from my pr perspective, with all that said, all the companies that I've invested in, I believe that the biggest investment that I ever made is what I'm investing in right now, and that is investing in, in teachers, in ensuring that they have the tools and the content and the ability to teach our, our students. Thank you. So, Dr. Siddiqui, you mentioned earlier about our work in North Carolina with Governor Hunt and the Drive Task Force. Uh, could you give an overview of the state's role in setting and ensuring teacher recruitment remains a priority? What are the best practices that help to recruit and retain teachers? Yeah, thank you. So, we approach our work uh, in three different buckets. We work with the executive branch, so we're working with sitting governors. So, in North Carolina, obviously, we have a great relationship with Governor Cooper. Um, we also work with the legislature. I think it's very important to engage with the legislature because anything uh, the governor, he or she wants to do, there has to be some type of environment that is welcoming to said issue. Uh, and, and make no mistake, those issues go back and forth. We also want to make sure that the governor is embracing things that maybe an education chair is, is leaning in on or somebody on the education committee's uh, bill they're carrying. So what we're trying to do is do some capacity building. The data... Uh, to me is the most important thing because people look at data and they respect, our elected officials do, do look at the data. And so we've sort of taken the approach that Lumina took about 10 years, 12 years ago when they swept across the country with the post-secondary attainment uh, work and they were doing visits with gubernatorial candidates, sitting governors, legislative education and uh, appropriations chairs and, and entire committees. And I remember being in the governor's office, going to one of those dinners and following up, having the one-on-one -on -one sort of technical visit, and Virginia ended up, you know, sort of articulating, codifying uh, an attainment goal, and now I think all but three or four states have some type of attainment goal. So that is our goal. We want to say we're one million teachers of color, but we want our states and our state leaders to embrace the goal because they are going to be the ones that are going to be shepherding that goal, they being whomever is sitting in the legislature. And it has to be a goal that is bipartisan. It can't be a Republican issue. It can't be a Democratic issue. It's got to be a, a leadership issue. And so we're seeing us right now crafting, building the data. We're going to put it out on the website, and then we'll start doing these visits. We've already started some of these uh, visits because there's obviously 36 gubernatorial elections coming up. So we've made it part of our priority um, when we're visiting with candidates. Um, and we do visits on both sides of the aisle. Uh, we don't discriminate. Um, and so most times, they just don't know. They've heard, oh, yeah, I've heard we have a teacher issue. Oh, yeah, I think we need to improve teacher pay. But they're always taken aback when they hear the Delta. And I'll look at somebody not to throw stones at our friends in California, uh, especially since we're with the Reagan Institute in California. We, we love our Californians. Uh, but when we think of California, you generally probably think blue state, fairly liberal, progressive state, diverse state. California has the biggest uh, portion of the one million pie. They need about 140,000 teachers. Uh, to, uh, to satisfy the goal. So what we have to do is we have to deconstruct the one million and assign the responsibility to states while we're also educating them on sort of the, the, their share, uh, their lift, if you will. So that's the way we've been approaching the work, and it is a, it's the long game we're playing. Thank you. I think it's so important to really think about what that means across the country, and giving those state-specific data examples really helps to put in perspective where the work is needed and where the resources are. Um, will be used in a way that helps to impact our goal to 1 million teachers and 30,000 leaders of color, so thank you. Dr. Harris, you mentioned before about professional development, and as we've seen throughout the pandemic, the way that professional development has changed in terms of being virtual, creating more access, more opportunities for learning. 
As you think about the work that you all are doing at the National Math and Science Initiative um, and the work that you do to change systems by empowering leaders, what tools are essential to ensuring that teachers are supported post-pandemic and being able to be effective, uh, to feel valued, and to continue in the teaching profession? That's a good question. Thank you so much for that. Um, so our job, I mentioned earlier, is to focus on teachers. I mean, that we're intentional about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've actually created a, a new strategic plan which has that, underscores scores that. Uh, we also are um, wanting to deliver high quality STEM education, so we have to co combine those two. And so when you talk about a teacher shortage and you talk about you know, where teaching is going and the importance of having you know, diversity, you also should talk about the types of teachers that are in the classroom. Um, it said a minute ago that uh, about um, college, and I just want to make a, one comment, you know, a lot of universities these days are no longer having colleges of education. So when my mother was an educator, she went to a college of education, Prairie View a &M University. And now, in many institutions, they no longer have colleges of education. So that's a, that's a big issue. So, and I, I should say that when they get that education, they get basic how to teach education, not specifically what the subjects are. So when they take that job and they go to a school district, they say, you're going to be teaching biology this year, or you're going to be teaching you know, chemistry this year. And they have to go and figure out how to do that. It, in one of our sessions when I started as the CEO, I met with one of the teachers in and, uh, and one of our trainings, and she says that I am one day ahead of my students. I said, what do you mean, <laughs> one day ahead of my students? She said, well, they told me to teach biology this year. They gave me the, the handbook, the student handbook, and the teacher handbook. So I read the, the lesson the night before I go and teach the, the teachers. They did not have the training to adequately teach the, those students. And so you know it yourself that you know, the biggest influence that you have when you're going through the education process is your teacher. Uh, I'd be willing to, to bet that uh, all of you are doing what you're doing because of a teacher who loved what they're doing, not only loved what they're doing, but was able to teach it in a way that you loved it too. So that's the job I think that we have to do and that's what we try to do um, in, our, in our training sessions. So we bring these teachers that may be uh, a biology, you know, one biology teacher from this, this school and another biology teacher from that school, and they don't have anybody to, to discuss what the issues are when they're training their students, and we make them part of a community. And so now they're able to not only learn from us, but to learn from themselves and carry that, um, that relationship forward into delivering you know, the, the courses that they're going to take uh, for that next year. So we think that's really, really key. And you mentioned leadership, and I'll, I'll get into detail a little bit more, but we also found that it's necessary to create an environment for the teachers so that they are supported by the administration, by the principal, by, by the assistant principals, and, and by the uh, the upper administration, the superintendents, and so we actually have training for, for them too. I'll talk about that more later. Thank you so much for sharing that. Dr. Brownie, more recently I read an article that talks about having schools that are fully resourced as a way to retain teachers. As a former school social worker, I'm sure you're aware of some of the challenges that come with serving multiple schools and districts. And so, um, as you've mentioned, the salary increase that has happened is a salary increase enough to recruit additional teachers into the classroom and to retain those who are there? What other strategies have you seen across states that have been successful um, in achieving the retention rates needed um, for schools? Yes, it's a good question, and I think it's two-part. One, I'll say, we've been talking about the context, that this is a long-standing issue. That is absolutely true. One piece that I, want, I do want to sort of raise in this labor market Teachers are actually have very durable skills, transferable skills, and so we're seeing so many sectors recruit teachers out of the classroom 
into these other sectors. So that's the one piece I would say that's playing a role in the acceleration of the rate at which teachers are leaving the profession. But what's interesting when you, at some of the previous uh, sessions and panels today, sort of talked about the fact that education is a very local issue. So there are things absolutely that Javay is talking about at the state level through policy levers that can happen. There's also things at the community level. I grew up in rural Arkansas. So my teachers were in my community. So where there are kids, guess what? There are adults. That means that there, there's your potential untapped pipeline of students, I mean of teachers. And so we're seeing communities and districts actually tap into that grow your own models where instead of pretending that you're gonna recruit teachers from Brooklyn to come to rural Arkansas, <laughs> where I grew up, it's just not going to happen, likely. And so while I appreciate and love the programs that are sort of uh, plugging the gaps, like Teach for America, like some of these other sort of alt-cert programs, we also have to address the larger issue and have a sustainable pipeline of talent. One of the examples we've seen in Tennessee, many of you uh, may have heard, Tennessee is actually the first state to actually have a fully adopted and approved apprenticeship model. And the reason that matters, we often talk about some of the um, sectors where you know the apprenticeship is how they get trained. Plumbers I had a repairman at my house today, of course, while I'm in DC. Um, to, he just showed up to fix something, right? He got trained through an apprentice, right? And so as we think about developing and training teachers, opening up those types of pathways really matter. Not only the t apprenticeship model in Tennessee that we've seen um, and that other states are now even looking at, it opens up additional dollars. Now think about, we're talking about the salary but now imagine teachers, I'm a, I was a first gen college student. Teachers, many of them, especially teachers of color, candidates of color, likely are, more be, are going to be first gen college students. We want them to take on more debt to become a teacher to then be paid almost minimum wages, right? In some cases, people ask, at, like I grew up extremely poor in the Deep South and went to Yale. They're like, oh, how did you get there? It literally was my teachers that set me up for success. But the piece I mentioned, it just so happened, my mom's sister was a teacher in Arkansas, barely making minimum wage, moved to Connecticut to double her salary just to make it. And so that was one less teacher of color effective in Arkansas. So that literally is how I ended up choosing Yale, because it was like, oh, my aunt's there, right? But my point in, in telling that is that as we think about what local communities are doing, when there is a teacher shortage, it is often the super, seen as the superintendent's fault versus the community coming together to look at it as a, in a cross-sector way across the Department of Labor, across workforce, across K-12, and across those, you know, all of those <laughs> sectors to leverage dollars, resources to both incentivize and remove some of those barriers um, that we see that keep teachers, can potential candidates from coming in. The last thing I'll say, I appreciated your comment about the Deterior, well, the non-existence in some cases of colleges of ed. We actually worked um, with United Negro College Fund sort of going around the country on college campuses talking to students that were freshmen and sophomores because the research shows if you wait until college students are, you know, juniors, the likelihood of them choosing teaching as a profession is in the teens. If you start much earlier, it's much higher. But I was surprised, I'll say, to go to some of those campuses and see even premier HBCUs like Xavier, literally there were students on campus that said, oh, education is a major here. Now I applaud Xavier. We all know they produce great rates in getting kids of color into medical school. Great program, but it was, it was fascinating that even at that premier college, students on campus didn't even know. So we've got to do a much better job going earlier. Even some districts are going into high school. There was future teachers of America when I was in high school. So programs like that grow your own, that not just once they're adults, but even going back into high school and having these sort of apprenticeship and sort of on-ramps for people to come into the profession. It's going to be really key if we're going to solve this. And the point about community is so important because I was fortunate enough to see my teachers, whether it was at church or with community organizations and my mom being a member, historically black sororities, those teachers were there too. And so as we think about the state role in this and also those community pieces, that's so important in thinking about how this um, conversation is so nuanced by so many other aspects that we often forget to include. Um, so this is our last uh, question and this is for each of our panelists. We'll start with Dr. Harris. 
Um, and you alluded to some of this earlier around leaders. So in addition to teacher attrition, states are also concerned about school and district leaders leaving their roles. How do these concerns overlap with conversations around the teaching profession? And what opportunities do states have to address the recruitment and reten retention of all educators? Well, I'm not going to answer all of those questions. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I want to go back to something that uh, um, was said earlier about, about teachers. Uh, one of the things that we do at the National Math and Science Initiative is that we're involved in teacher preparation. And so in that program, we are in 50, 65 universities uh, promoting education. You know, so taking kids, not kids anymore, but taking uh, people who are majoring in STEM fields and introducing them to our program uh, so that they get introduced right at the beginning, uh, that teacher being a teacher's profession. And so they end up getting their degree also with the ability to teach when they graduate, which is a, which is a great thing. We have had a lot of graduates from, from that program. So back on, on the question, the one part of the question I'm going to answer, <laughs> and that is uh, one of the things we, we find is very important is, is leadership, is getting at leadership. So when you're implementing a program like a STEM-based program where you're trying to raise the, the bar of education with, within a um, district or within the school in itself, you have to start at the top. And so many times I know that the superintendents and, and uh, administrators are former teachers, but sometimes when you get up at, at that level, you forget you know, where you came from and you forget what is necessary. And so part of our teaching program, our uh, leadership program, is to bring superintendents, principals, into specific training for them. And so they go through this four days of intensive training where they not only learn you know, why STEM is important, but how to implement STEM uh, within the school. We also emphasize the point that you just can't do elementary school separately from, from middle school, separately from high school. And so we have something called vertical training. And we remind them how important it is from one grade to lead to the next and how to interconnect the students the uh, teachers so that they communicate from grade level to grade level. So when a student starts in elementary school, by the time they get to high school, they are ready for high level coursework and that's the important thing or whatever career that they want to go into. So that's something that, that we have implemented and it's worked out and we've received great reviews from mm -hmm. superintendents on this. Thank you so much for sharing. Dr. Siddiqui. So one thing we do, Governor Hunt has been big on uh, going to schools. This is something he ran on and he did when he was governor for four terms. And now as we engage with future governors and even sitting governors, uh, oftentimes I hear him encouraging them. And governor Kane is another one, former governor of New, New Jersey, you know, who was a university president after, uh, who's encouraging these future electeds or future executive uh, governors to, to go on campuses. If you go on campus and you're an elected official, the university presidents, who I think are part of the problem, uh, and that's why folks like Michael Crow get so much love because he seems to be part of the solution. There's not enough university presidents, but invariably, when there's some type of roll out the red carpet, the governor's coming on campus, they go to the schools of engineering, the, the business schools, the medical schools, the law schools. They don't go to the schools of it. They don't showcase their schools. Of it. They're like almost not proud of it, and I think that's part of the problem. The reason they're closing is because revenues are down, right? And so it's not a money maker. Alumni. In case you didn't realize, teacher alumni don't give a whole lot back to universities. So it's not a, a cash cow, so like playing the long games. They're not investing because they don't see a lot of return coming back from their, their, their uh, e e EPP graduates. But uh, Governor Stratton, who's lieutenant governor in Illinois, uh, just completed a statewide circuit. Uh, she did over the course of six months, and she visited every educator prep program because uh, she sees the, the value in this, and she's going, and it almost lifts up these university leaders. It creates a little bit of a coalition. So that's where we can be part of the solution as elected folks. Say, be part of, get people excited, enthused about the value proposition. The last thing I'll say, because I'm perplexed by it, and I'm, I was a classroom teacher, I was a school principal. Sometimes we're, the, we're our worst enemies. We sit in front of 30, 150 kids a day, if you're a principal of 15, 2,000, uh, somebody, uh, Gregory was here, I think it's 4,000 uh, uh, high school across the river here. 
4,000 kids every day you have a chance to influence. You have a captive audience. And what do they likely hear over the course of their journey through K-12? Don't do it. Don't come in here. I'm pulling my hair. You guys are driving me insane. You know, all, it's always bad, bad, bad. And then we at home, how many of us, when you, when you first meet your child, you think, God, I can't wait for this, my baby girl to grow up and be a teacher. I, I can tell you, I, I wanted her to be a doctor. I wanted her to be an engineer. I wanted her to be a lawyer. I wanted her to be able to pay for her things so she didn't come asking me to pay for her things. So <laughs> that's what I was thinking about you, you as parents. So, so it's like a really complicated problem. And so I, I'd love to see some things like, um, you know, I know they're debating up here, uh, loan forgiveness, zero, no, no, basically zero debt. I'd love to see even a simple freeze, just a 0% interest loan on schools of education. They go and do five years, three to five years of classroom, completely wipe out their debt, give them a nice $20,000 sign-on bonus. Now you make the profit. You look at these careers as five-year deals. That's where somebody mentioned uh, the teachers' association or unions earlier. They're looking out for the 10 to 15, 20-year employee. We have to make the, the proposition excitable around the zero to five-year teacher. How do we get you for five years? That's what Teach for America, Teach for America, the issue we have with, a lot of people had with them, I love them, was only two years. They only, they only give them two years. Well, we have such a problem right now, thousands of vacancies, and we're about to start school here in two weeks. So I think this is a time that uh, we can probably take advantage of uh, because of the circumstance, the conditions we're in. Hopefully something bold will come out of this moment. Dr. Browning? Uh, yeah, I think that it's no, it's not lost on me that next year is the 40th anniversary of a nation at risk, and here we are at the Reagan Institute. And if you read the report, I really encourage you to go back and read it. It could have been written this week. Mm -hmm. Like some of the things we had that were highlighted in that are still true today. And so when I think about leadership, all the things everyone said about is, are true about, we're losing superintendents, we're losing principals. It's not just teachers, it's the whole pipeline. But there is something about recognizing sort of the stakes here, that to your point, now that the attention is there about sort of the urgency of the moment, I'm, very, I'm hopeful that sort of out of that cry, out of this crisis, that we can really look for some more action in both. For better or for worse, a nation at risk did produce action. Now, we haven't gotten to where we need to get to at all by any means, but it did spark action. And so I'm hopeful that we'll actually look for solutions and look for action at every leadership level. Seeing governors take, you know, initiative to create policies and levers to influence this. Seeing mayors, I mean, the one thing you see, housing, this comes up a lot. I was mm -hmm. a, rural, a rural kid. I care a lot about rural, rural education. Housing, if you can't recruit teachers, if there's no stable housing in your community, mayors have, you know, levers that they could do to help do that. So, again, my point is it cannot be on principals and superintendents alone to solve this. It's going to take, take cross-sector leadership and at every level of our democracy. Well, I really appreciate you all being here today and not only sharing your thoughts, but also real strategies and ways that policymakers, educators can come together. Um, and so this has been such a great experience to hear the work that you all are doing, the work that aligns, and also just really being able to share and probably provide some hope that there are solutions. We just really need to be intentional and come together to make sure that those things are happening in our communities. Uh, that will be the end of our panel for today. Um, so thank you all for being here.